All right. Welcome back, KetoCon 2019. By the way, did you guys know that was a hashtag? KetoCon 2019 that you're supposed to use every time you post something on social media? If you, if you do that, you'll be entered into a drawing for a free VIP ticket, possibly, for next year. You don't want to miss that. This is our medical panel. So one of these things is not like the other. That would be me. I have no idea. These are the experts. I'm just here to make sure that you people stay nice and orderly. So when you're asking questions, try to keep the questions from being super, super personal about solving your own personal medical problem because as smart as the collective brains to my left are, they can't diagnose you behind a microphone in the matter of two minutes. Although I'm pretty sure Dr. Berry probably would be able to. Um, okay, so I, what I would like to do is have everyone just quickly introduce themselves to anyone who is not familiar. Hi, I'm Christy Kesslering, radiation oncologist. Uh, I'm Nadir Ali, interventional cardiologist. I'm Anna Kabeka, gynecologist and obstetrician. I'm Ken Berry, family practice. I'm Allie Miller, registered dietitian and functional medicine. Okay, so we've got a wide variety of expertise, so I would like for everyone to, if you have a question, please uh, start forming a line here on the microphone in the middle, and we will get to them as quickly as we can. We've got about an hour and a half, is that about right? Is that what everyone signed the contract for, an hour and a half? Yeah? Um, so let's, let's get to it. We've got our first question coming up. And, and when you're asking, um, if we need to adjust the height of the microphone, uh, we can easily do that by me simply suggesting that it get adjusted. <laughs> well done, sir. Well done. Bald guys, we got to stick together. You know what I'm saying? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, this is, I'm not asking for medical Get closer to the okay. mic. As soon as you start talking, there you go. Okay. I'm not asking for medical advice. I just want to tell you, uh, ask you uh, your opinion of what... Um, someone should do when uh, I've been keto for uh, four years, lost 80 pounds, but I have lupus and RSD, reflex sympathetic dystrophy. I was in remission when I lost that weight. I fell out of remission two years ago from both lupus and RSD, been in a stall for two years. My inflammation markers are terrible. My RSD is really bad. My cortisol is high because my sympathetic uh, nervous system is, is, you know, fighting my parasympathetic nervous system. So I can't get into ketosis no matter what I've done. I've done fast, long periods of fasting, short periods of fasting, carnivore, you name it. I've done it. I've never cheated. I, I've actually gained 10 pounds for I don't know why. So is there any advice you would have for me? Like what would be my next step? I also have terrible thyroid issues that armor is uh, not really helping my vitamin D is nine, can't get it up no matter what I do. So I would start with, my philosophy is when you're losing, and when you're using fat as fuel and you're mm -hmm. losing a substantial amount of body fat, we have to understand that body fat is composed of adipocytes, a particular type of cell that has hormetic influence in the body or hormonal influence in the body. Within our fat cells, we store, first off, fat cells are estrogenic in their nature, and mm -hmm. autoimmune disease tends to be correlated with estrogen dominance, right? <laughs> we also know that our fat cells are going to store endocrine disrupting compounds. So your years of exposure of plastics, perfumes, pesticides, all of that is going to be stored in the body fat that was lost and is now circulating in the system, waiting to make distress on your endocrine glands, right? So Thyroid can be influenced by that. Pancreatic mm -hmm. function can be influenced by that. Adrenals can be influenced by that. And we also store corticosteroids or cortisol in the mm -hmm. body fat as well. So I would start with supporting your liver. Um, mm -hmm. Anytime we lose more than 10% of our body weight, I highly suggest doing detox support with supplements. And mm -hmm. I know I use food as medicine as the primary implement of diet strategy, but when you're making dynamic body composition changes such as that, you need to upregulate the filtration system that's going to conjugate and remove these compounds that are going to create metabolic distress. You have to also ensure beyond the liver being optimized that the colon is optimized because that's your other primary detoxification regulating system for the body. So having a bowel movement every day, if you aren't, you need to problem solve that. Is it dysbiosis or bacterial overgrowth? Do you need probiotic? Do you need to make 
play with electrolytes to help with bowel regulation, play with different forms of magnesium. Um, but regulating bowel regularity and liver function would be my first go-to to kind of hit that whole world. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Next question. Vitamin D is also made by the liver and kidneys too, so that all goes back to that. Okay, I have two things. One's a question. Uh, um, in terms of electrolytes. You're gonna have to get a little closer to the mic. Don't yeah, be shy and, and speak up a little bit. Have to move this. All right, is that better? Much better. All right. Um, Electrolytes are heavily promoted, and I know a lot of people here sell them, and so they, my question might not be appreciated that much, but the, the idea of those of us who take ACE inhibitors, it have, I have a question about that because I do not, t I, I take an ACE inhibitor, lisinopril, and I have a Facebook group for people over 50, and a lot of those, a lot of people are taking that kind of thing. And uh, Dr. Berry was talking about taking uh, Lugol's for uh, iodine, and when I ordered it, I read it and it said, do not take if you're taking an ACE inhibitor. And I started looking into that and they were saying you could get dangerous levels of potassium. Now, we will be losing potassium, but not as much if you have an ACE inhibitor. And I don't have any real information other than that little bit of information. I haven't been able to find anything on it. So I would like to, I take, I take potassium like, I take a, um, electrolytes like once a month rather than daily. <laughs> and so, Dr. Barry, she called you out, so you got to... <laughs> so, every mammal on the planet needs iodine or it will die. Mm -hmm. uh, you're worried about the potassium in the potassium iodine. Well, that they warned about it. They say don't Yeah, take. and that, that, that warning is, is there for the attorneys. I have mm -hmm. never, ever seen a patient have an elevated potassium level because they were taking an iodine uh, Lugol. Mm -hmm. I've never, ever seen that. Taking an ACE inhibitor, you do have to be a little more cognizant of your potassium intake. Uh, if you have normal kidney function, it's virtually impossible to take too much potassium unless you're taking just a, a ridiculous amount. The amount that you're going to get in, in the pota potassium iodide of Lugol's is not going to move your uh, serum potassium level mm -hmm one-tenth of a point. So don't worry about that. But you absolutely need your iodine. That's, that's vital for proper function. If you can get it in your diet, I'm 100% for that, but it's quite challenging to get enough iodine in the, the, the foodstuffs mm -hmm. we have available currently. Mm -hmm. Well, and it, but my concern is that if people on keto are taking electrolytes every day, and if can that be a problem for people who are on ACE inhibitors? If they have significant amounts of kidney function impairment, that can be a problem, but they'll know about that and they'll work no, no. with their doctor on that. If you have normal kidney function, then you're not going to take too, too many electrolytes. It's almost impossible. Uh, you need electrolytes every day. That's why we take them every day. Uh, 50,000 years ago, we got electrolytes from the groundwater that we drank and from the nose to tail animals because we didn't just eat the ribeye back then, we ate it all. And there's, there's plenty of potassium, magnesium, and all the other mm -hmm. electrolytes in that. But, and so a lot of us don't eat nose to tail and we don't drink mud puddle water anymore because that has its own Speak danger. Speak for yourself. Well, some of us do. <laughs> and so we supplement with something that's very convenient. Do you have to do that? No, you don't have to do that. Uh, but many people feel much, much better when they do. Okay, and I, one other thing, which uh, is I've been trying to contact you for months. My group, um, Confidently Keto, my Facebook group, has raised some money for you when you had the fire, and I've been trying to give you money, and I've said <laughs> nobody ever responds to me. Oh, I would just like to say he will take cash right now. Like, so, <laughs> Honey, keep your money. Just share a video. That's all I want you yeah. to do. That's it. That's it. No, don't still do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. Oh, you got to take it now. You, you got to so take much. it now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. If the IRS is watching, you didn't see nothing.
Next question, please. Hi, I think this might be for Dr. Ali, I'm not sure. Um, I have an HRV question. Um, if somebody has chronically low HRV, pretty much across the board, but inflammation markers are low, sleep is on point, diet is on point, the only thing would be autoimmune disease, like Hashimoto's, even if all thyroid markers are normal, but antibodies are still a little bit elevated, would that still cause a very low HRV, even with exercise, like literally everything on point, extended fasting, 18-hour fasting, pretty much everything being perfect? So basically, you're talking about your heart rate variability being low, and uh, there, it, it depends on where you stand in, in the sense that do you exercise too much? People who over-exercise can have a low heart rate variability. And the measures for heart rate variability, like the aura ring or the watch, they may not be as sensitive. So if what you're telling me is that every little marker on you, the inflammation markers, your biorhythm, your sleep is all accurate, and it's only that you're showing a low HRV, I'm not really truly sure that it means something really bad. Okay. For people who don't understand what HRV is, is that a metronome beats at significant periodicity, just very regular. And our heart is not supposed to do that. It's supposed to have slight variations from beat to beat. And the less the variation, the worse it is. So I guess I'm not answering your question, but I think I'd have to explore a little bit more. I mean, could it possibly have anything to do with even though the thyroid levels are normal across the board, but the antibodies are still elevated, even by taking like LDN and all of the other possible things to do, that that could be causing a sympathetic situation that could be causing that issue? You know, I couldn't quite hear your question because of the mic. Uh, I don't know if there's any way. Get a little closer, get a little oh, closer. Sorry. Could it possibly be that even though the thyroid markers are normal, but the antibodies are still high, that there's a sympathetic nervous system issue that's causing higher levels of just constant fight or flight, and as a result, the HRV starts to drop, even if the exercise isn't too much, like if it's very moderate? So if your thyroid is dysregulated and if your sympathetic markers are high, yes. A higher sympathetic tone is known to reduce the heart rate variability. Okay, thank Do you. Dr. Kapeka? Yeah, I think one thing with, that we see in clients with chronic low heart rate variability is, you know, is the stress response, right? Is trauma, is, you know, adverse childhood experiences, is history of car accident or something that could have traumatized you and that you're still like on that you know, fight or flight mechanism. So working with something like heart math and training your physiology to increase its variability is, is beneficial too. So I would like dig deeper too to see why are you pedal to the metal, you know, beyond thyroid. Okay. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Anyone else have a comment? Oh, no. Okay, next question, please. Hi. Uh, my question is for Dr. Kesslering. My question is for Dr. Kesslering. And I thought that your presentation was fantastic. It was just so many citations, so much to follow up on. Uh, I'm sure you're aware Dr. Thomas Seafried had a recent publication in the last month um, about targeting both funnels into glycolysis. And he didn't use any standard of care uh, in there. He didn't use any radiation. And treated late stage glioblastoma and had pretty compelling results. I was wondering if you could comment on the future of standard of care, where you think it's going, if it will change, if maybe replace well, it. Well, yeah, thanks. Uh, in the real world, there's not a whole lot of keto going on in the clinic, so we're really, really far away from getting rid of standard of care. Um, I think that there's, right now, the beauty really, in my opinion, is in the combination. I think that even in a lot of this research, which I think is awesome because we need it, and we need to look at less toxic therapies or dose reductions or other things that maybe we can do uh, and, and having a potentiation with a ketogenic diet. Um, still looking at the results that are coming out, still 
don't, eat, don't look as good as Sheck's data with the combination of ketogenic diets and standard of care. So again, I, I, I think it's awesome and I think that, that it'll probably be past my time when that really happens, but I think the research is great and I think the patients that are looking to get involved with this research is great. I know that um, Dr. Volokh has a, a stage four breast cancer trial right now at, at uh, Ohio State. So there are some trials that are being done. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of funding in diet research. Um, so, so we're gonna struggle to get there, but I think it's exciting. Um, my question is, might we minimize toxicity and potentiate the therapies, um, including some form potentially of standard therapy? Okay. Can, I, can I just come in as, as the one like ignorant non-medical person? When I actually talked to Dr. Seafried a while back, um, one of the comments he made, very similar to what you're saying, Dr. Kesswaring, is there's very little funding in the United States for this kind of thing, and there's very little uh, ability to get it approved. But overseas, when, when you have U.S. clinics partnering with up-and-coming places overseas, it's much easier to get these things um, these trials run, these, these, these papers published, these, these, these things funded. So we, at the United States as the world leader in just about everything, good and bad, has to look overseas to start kind of creeping this stuff in through the cracks. So you want to get standard of care changed, it has to come through the scientific literature. And the only way you're going to get that happen is by sort of backdooring it by going through places that are not with a lot of eyeballs on them right now publish an amazing paper, have a bunch of eyeballs become on it, that now we've got people paying attention. So from what I spoke to him, and if I'm speaking out of turn, please ignore me, but from Dr. Seafried, that's, that's his plan, that's his, his course of action. I hope I didn't give too much away. Again, if you're the IRS and you're listening, you heard nothing, so. Excellent, thank you guys. Next question, please. Hi, um, so my question is, um, if somebody is healing from adrenal fatigue, um, Hold on, one second. If, if anyone is healing from adrenal fatigue, um, possibly stage three, um, there's a lot of contradictory information about whether intermittent fasting is, is good for that or not. Um, so I just wanted to know what you guys thought about that. So I don't think any human being is going to be harmed by intermittent fasting. Intermittent fasting is a normal physiological thing that we all benefit from. I don't think there's an exception to that that I can think of or have ever heard of that I put any merit in whatsoever. Uh, also, um, the, the adrenal fatigue paradigm of thinking about the adrenal glands and the symptoms that you're having sometimes can be a worrisome paradigm and it, and it can misdirect you from looking more completely at the patient. And so, uh, yeah, definitely look at the adrenals and the adrenal function and take that into consideration. But the whole patient must be considered because I've seen many people who've come to my practice saying, oh, I've been diagnosed with adrenal fatigue and they had hypothyroidism and it just hadn't been diagnosed. I've seen that multiple times in other endocrine uh, abnormalities that were just misdiagnosed or undiagnosed. And it was kind of put in the catch-all of adrenal fatigue, which many doctors use as an umbrella diagnosis, almost like fibromyalgia or depression or chronic fatigue or whatever. They, they just lump you in that, and it doesn't really mean anything. Does that make sense? And so I, I, I think that you're never going to harm yourself by uh, intelligent intermittent fasting. Allie? But that being oh. said, yeah. no, Allie has something to say about that. <laughs> As a female with ovaries, um, I just want to say, just saying, just saying, women's bodies work differently than men's. Um, I, I just want to say, what, you assume he doesn't have ovaries. I mean, this is just like the puddle water. I don't know, um, but no, my concern in clinic. If we're talking about clinical adrenal insufficiency, you've had a four-point cortisol assessment, DHEA, right? We're talking like that. Right. So. Um, the connection is the HPA access, and the connection always is allowing the body to feel safe. So if your body feels insecure and food insecure, that can be a problem. Intermittent fasting alone does not cause that. Total calorie restriction does, so it's fair to say that. You can do a 16-8 as long as you're feeding your body. If you're at ideal body fat or low body fat, you need to feed your body, otherwise your body is going to put out excessive epinephrine, adrenaline, fight or flight chemical, which is tied, made by the 
the adrenal, right? Not the adrenal cortex, but the adrenal medulla makes epinephrine. And it's a signal to your body that this isn't a safe environment. And if we connect that to the thyroid, the thyroid's gonna upregulate reverse T3, which is going to interfere with the active thyroid hormone. We're also gonna see cortisol interfere with the conversion of T4 into T3. So it is very real. And what we need to watch out for is trying to do everything at once. You can do everything, just not at the same time. You can't over-caffeinate, over-exercise, under-sleep, over-stress, and fast and calorie restrict and expect your body to say thank you at the end of the day, you know? And that's just the reality. I deal with a lot of, I'm a mom. That was one day? (laughs) (laughs) No, but I mean, I'm a mom of a toddler and that's my, my clientele are women that don't listen to the feedback of their body of saying no. They read about adding another layer to their health journey, like now I'm gonna layer on sauna. Now the sauna upregulates cortisol. Over time, it's a hormetic stressor that is very therapeutic and healing for the body, just like exercise, right? But we have to figure out what part of our wellness journey gets us off, focus on that, select that. But I mean, I'm a huge proponent of the ketogenic diet does not burn out your adrenals. In fact, a high fat diet can actually support hormone rebound, but you cannot starve yourself to achieve hormonal balance as a female. Thank you. I was waiting for her to drop the mic just now, so. But a she passionate didn't. about that. One. Thank you. I, I thank just you. Deal with a lot of broken women. Thank you. Next question. Hi. Let me first start by saying thank you for all your presentations. It's been absolutely amazing listening to all of you. They've been absolutely phenomenal. So, um, so my first question. I have two questions. First, my wife has had migraines for years and years. About a year and a half ago, she went to keto. They've gotten. Uh, they've gotten absolutely much, much better. However, uh, seeing a hematologist, we believe that she probably has Epstein-Barr from high IgM levels from six, last time it was in the 800s, so we kind of think it's Epstein-Barr. So I'm wondering if there's any tweaks that you can make from keto or carnivore that might make that a little bit better. As well, as the second question is pregnancy. Um, Are there any tweaks, same thing, keto or carnivore, that might make things a little bit more optimal in the pregnancy. We all know who's gonna answer this one. Yes. <laughs> well, first of all, I think you're pretty awesome here advocating for your wife, so I congratulate you. Yeah, pretty awesome. Love you for that. And I think, um, you know, for the migraines, if they're cyclical or not, I mean, we really look at food sensitivities for migraines and then hormonal triggers. Mm-hmm. So we wanna, tease those two out. And then thiamine, you know, or vitamin B2, 100 to 200 milligrams on a daily basis or, you know, to supplement with or to add at the first inclination of a migraine could be beneficial. And a good night's sleep always conserving, mm-hmm. you know, your, you know, really prioritizing sleep is, is truly beneficial. And if there's a menstrual migraine type of component to it, we want to look, would a little bit of estrogen help or would a little bit of progesterone help in that instance? Mm-hmm. And then for helping clients get pregnant, and we were talking about keto babies. I talk about, you know, our mighty maca babies, you know, like having adrenal, like maca, great, um, a great root that is an adaptogenic formula that we know is adrenal adaptogen, maybe a a genetic adaptogen too, can be beneficial with additional alkalinizing and detoxifying support to help with, um, you know, that regulation of hormonal balance, especially cyclically. Mm -hmm. So those would be some things that I would look at optimizing. Okay, great. The one other thing I would say for migraines, if you're not optimizing magnesium, sometimes that'll be another trick. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank Thank you. you. Next question, please. Hi, guys. Thank you so much for being here and uh, supporting us. Um, my question, within our, within our community, one of the questions that common, commonly comes up with women that are of my age transitioning over getting a little bit older, our hormones getting a little whacked out. A lot of times when we go in and we talk to our doctors, our doctors are are suggesting things such as um, bioidentical hormone replacement. And do y'all recommend um, in doing something like that or so although is the question is the question is hormone replacement good or bad kind of or okay. or uh, to, to me it seems 
it's a natural thing to, to get older. And um, can we treat some of those symptoms just with our diet? Or do we buy into having those types of treatments done? So, Dr. Kopeka, why don't you take the first swing at it? And then, no? <laughs> okay, okay. So then, Allie, will you take okay, a swing? Yeah. Okay. I, th I think that's a common question that I get. You know, it, menopause is a natural process. I mean, should I treat it with medication, right? Or even if it's hormones, bioidentical hormones, menopause is a natural process. Menopause is mandatory, suffering is optional, right? So we, we see a lot of suffering, right? 80% mm -hmm. of women are significantly symptomatic in the perimenopause menopause. And we know this to be a period of neuro, you know, neurologic, neuroendocrine vulnerability. So unless we're living, in my opinion, okay, this is my opinion more than science-based Emory University trained advice, is that if we lived in the Amazon, we lived out in nature, we picked our food, drank from beautiful streams, and, you know, it received more than vitamin D from the sun on a regular basis, rose with the sun, slept with the setting of the sun, I think that would be a whole nother situation. I've traveled around the world and lived and worked in cultures that actually do that, and it's amazing, especially thinking specifically of Indonesia, where they're experiencing a gratitude practice three times a day. I mean, that's hugely mm -hmm. different than the way I live in America. I don't know about many of you, but I found that it incredibly beneficial to use adaptogens, detox the body, support the liver, and support hormones, cushion it. I'm not saying hormones of a 30-year-old. I'm saying just provide a natural balance, especially progesterone and DHEA. And that's the angle I take before estrogen and testosterone and other things. But after optimizing, you know, as everyone here would say, your magnesium, your vitamins, your minerals, you know, your detox pathways, and certainly the lifestyle that works with mother nature as opposed to against it. That's what I would say. Allie? Yeah, sure. I, I would say that Absolutely, I, that bioidentical hormone therapy, there's a place for it. I never advocate for it without clinical testing. That's never something that you want. It's, it's, it's very fortunate and unfortunate that bioidentical progesterone can now be purchased at a grocery store. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's yam derived, but it has a significant influence on the body. And with hormone, less is always more. If you have excessive circulating hormone, that's going to distress the liver, right? Mm -hmm. And the liver has so many other things to do, like produce ketones mm -hmm. and many other things. Um, so we want to test if we're to use, uh, but I would definitely second Dr. Quebec in the sense of check where your, I go back to the HPA axis, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenals, your fight or flight system, mm -hmm. and also your personal story. What was your metabolic handicap prior to transitioning into premenopause and menopausal transition? Mm -hmm. Did you lose a significant amount of weight? And if you did, you're likely susceptible to, and to estrogen dominance, like I mentioned with my first answer about those endocrine disrupting chemicals and the estrogens that are released from your fat. So I always, rather than bringing progesterone to the table, I would prefer you start with detoxifying any excess hormone first, get your system at a set point, and then do some testing once you're supporting the glands that aid in production and don't hinder the productive pathway. Because again, if the body feels safe, it's going to be in that parasympathetic rest, digest, reproduce. So all the reproductive hormone is all in that world. If you're in a sympathetic state, your body feels insecure and it shuts down that mechanism. It's going to feel more dynamic of a transition. So absolutely, 100% agree. You have to have your nutrition and your lifestyle under control. You have to have those taken care of. And then with that being said, if you're still having significant menopausal symptoms, if it is affecting your mental ability to remember, your physical ability to be active and enjoy life, your ability in the bedroom and other places, then I'm 100% I'm okay with bioidentical hormones. I'm, I'm completely against any synthetic Franken hormone whatsoever. If, if it has a patent on it, don't put it in your mouth. It will increase your risk of cancer. How do you know? The end, okay? Yeah, how well, do you, you know, know if because if, if you, if, it's a pill. Any estrogen that comes in a pill never goes in your body. That goes in the trash. Well, what any, about any testosterone that goes in a, it comes in a pill goes in the trash. It's, it's not real testosterone. You cannot get a patent on a natural molecule. That's, you mm -hmm. can't do that in the U.S. at least, right? Mm -hmm. And so if they say, oh, this is progesterone, it's patented, that's impossible. You can't. The judge wouldn't allow that. Does that mm -hmm. make sense? Yes. Now, you can get progesterone that's compounded and it's bioidentical in a, a PO or a bimouth form. 
that's the only one that's really safe to take by mouth. But I've had hundreds of women come to my clinic and I optimize and I don't, I never try to go above the physiologically normal levels ever, ever. And I never recommend bioidentical hormone optimization unless you're checking levels routinely because never do we, I want to make you supra therapeutic. I don't think that's a good thing. You don't want to be there, but so many women feel so much better and their life is their life again when you get their hormones optimized. And so I'm a big proponent of it if it's done properly with the understanding that you got to fix your diet and your lifestyle first. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. So I have a question on that. Is this do you, same thing for men? Yeah, absolutely. Same thing for men. Uh, you don't usually worry about the other hormones as much as you do testosterone in men because we're all about testosterone anyway, right? Let's just be yeah, honest. Yeah, we are. But, and so then again, I would put you in the, in the middle range to the upper range of normal for your age, I would still not make you supra therapeutic. That's not, you know, in, in men, you know, if it looks good, more is better. Absolutely does not apply to hormone optimization. I'm sorry, Brian. It, no, you can't have more. I will check with my dealer. I just wanted to comment on men with testosterone. I totally agree. You have to, you have to titrate based on age and we want to age gracefully, right? We don't want to fight the aging process. It's a natural biological process. And when we just take testosterone without testing, we aromatase that. And then men end up with gynomastia or man boobs. And they end up with estrogen dominance and belly fat and liver toxicity. So you never, I totally agree with every, what everyone's saying is we want to be mindful of what we're using with hormone. And we always want to clean up excess before repleting a deficiency. You have to support cleaning up the excess. You can't just add lighter fluid to fire. And one more point on testosterone for men, if that's okay, is that also, you know, finding out why it's low to begin with, right? The same with hormones, progesterone, estrogen, DHEA, right? We want to optimize our body's natural production. But I've seen so many just, you know, knee-jerk reaction of treating low testosterone without ever identifying why. Is it from toxins? Is it from heavy metals? Is it from thyroid issues? Is it, you know, what is the reason for the low testosterone to begin with? And let's look at optimizing our body's natural production of testosterone before supplementing, ideally. Next question. My question is about sugar and sweet foods and sweet treats. So I come from a background of um, diagnosed binge eating disorder and have reverse type 2 diabetes. So that's, that's my background, right? So sugar addict, carbohydrate addict. What I've noticed in this journey is I've probably had at least 100, if not hundreds, of people that I've tried to help along the way who get stuck that aren't willing, they're trading one addiction for another, so they're not quitting the sweet addiction, and they're trading regular sugar for sugar alcohols, stevia, xylitol, erythritol, and so forth. So I would like to have your input on what role sugar alcohols have in a ketogenic diet, um, and whether or not you keep sugar alcohols in your house. Oh, that's a trick question. What role it has and whether you're guilty of participating. Right? A total look. I will say that I have them in my house. I do have a, four kids, and so we do do treats on occasion. Um, I will maybe splurge on a birthday or something like that. But I, I really think that if you have a food addiction, um, that's where uh, I, I think that carnivore sometimes actually is better. I think that you, when you are not allowing yourself anything from plants, that includes the sugar alcohols, and then you are forced to kind of give those up, so to speak. Um, I, I think that you get rid of those cravings a little bit quicker. And if you, even if you're not including sugar alcohols, but you are doing um, more berries and, uh, you know, maybe slightly higher carb vegetables, you, you can still be in that same situation. So, so my bias is, is I'm still a hundred, you know, like a hundred percent girl, all or nothing. I try to really stay away from those. I try to encourage people to slowly, if they need to taper them out, I'm the cold turkey kind of girl. I'd rather just cut them out, go through the withdrawal and, you know, and suffer through it. And, and hopefully you come out on better on the other end. Now, I'm also not an addiction specialist, and I think sometimes even getting psychological help can certainly help in those situations. I would say as far as sugar or alcohols, the thing that I'd like to add is that 
definitely it causes an alteration in your colonic bacteria because those are, that's the fuel for some of the bacteria and it may not be for your benefit. The other thing is that many of these artificial sweeteners or even natural sweeteners, there is some data that they do increase insulin resistance in the way in which they give the sweetness index to your brain. So I don't think that those are things that you should rely on and cure that addiction with whatever tools that you have available. I'm, I'm maybe one of the only ones on this panel that doesn't have any sugar alcohols or non-caloric sweeteners in my household, um, including stevia, monk fruit, any of it. I don't mess with it. And my philosophy is this, channel savory. If you're trying to break up with carbohydrates, why are you telling your palate what sweet is? That creates what Dr. Nadir Ali was saying is GLP-1 receptor influence. And that can have not only a psychosomatic connection of you taste sweet, the body is assuming it's going to get glucose, it has an insulin response. I have seen clinically people go into hypoglycemic episodes from sugar, Can alcohols. you just repeat that? Because I think that's an important point that you just said as far as having an insulin response. What part? A GLP-1? You said something about ingesting and then having an insulin response. Y yeah, if you know. taste sweet, your body physiologically, just like Pavlov's dog, the bell was rung, the dinner was fed. The bell was rung, the dinner was fed. The bell so was rung, the So even if I'm salivated. eating a non-caloric sweetener, I'm still having an insulin response. <laughs> right? I just I, have to But wait, I got more. I got more. Hold I on. I have a feeling she's got an agenda, though. You can make a t-shirt. No, no, but I'm just trying to help people like me get better, yeah, yeah. and that's one roadblock yeah. I'm seeing consistently. And I, so I, I want to dumb it down for everyone. I agree with it. your question in the sense of the, my philosophy is this: if you're eating non-caloric sweeteners on a daily basis, every time you're in line at Starbucks, you're thinking of that scone or that mini cake or whatever the hell it is. And you're thinking of how you can mimic that with other chemical shitstorms. And you know what? That's not real food. What is real food and is magic of the ketogenic diet is channeling savory. I want you to salivate at a ribeye. I want you to salivate and eat a Marcona almond and be like, wow, I never knew almonds naturally were sweet. Because your palate has recalibrated. We need to stop dumbing down our palates with standard American hyperpalatable chemical-derived compounds and tell our body that that's food. That's not food. We need to break up with BS and start eating whole real foods. And then you can adjust your palate based on metabolic flexibility. When the insulin levels come down, then you can eat whole real foods in moderate amounts. I'm the maybe only person who puts banana in my ketogenic muffins. And throw it at me, but you can wear a continuous glucose monitor, and when the, banana ha when the muffin has one banana for 12 muffins, and it has almond flour, coconut oil, ghee, and the macros are as such, it's not going to spike your glucose if you're fat adapted. Now, just first five days into keto might not be a good idea, but if this is a lifestyle, real food. Thank you. Yeah. Can anyone else like feel the heat coming off? Of I'm aggressive. <laughs> I, I had a late day coffee. I shouldn't Allie. have drank coffee in the afternoon. I'm sorry. So I think the research is quite clear that a sweet taste in your mouth is going to elevate your insulin level. And I don't know if any research has been done on this, but I, I hypothesize that just looking at the scone. It's no, not, exact, not, it's not a joke. Insulin is kidding. the hormone that keeps fat on our body, right? That's exactly yes. right. Okay. And so if, if we evolutionarily developed a mechanism so that it's the instant we taste sweet, our insulin starts to elevate to compensate for the carbs that are inevitably coming 10,000 years ago, right? But now we've got stevia and all this other stuff, so there may not be carbs coming, but you still get the, the insulin response. I would not be surprised at all if anybody were interested in doing this research that just literally smelling fresh baked bread or looking at that scone would elevate your insulin at least a little bit. It would not surprise me one bit. And so I think with all that being said, I think some people can use the sugar alcohols as a weaning tool. Other people who are uh, teetotalers, all or none, absolutely not. You need to just stop it, go carnivore for a month or two or three Nothing has broken my cravings for, for sweets and carbohydrates like carnivore. Nothing has ever come close to that. Uh, it's almost like a superpower now. You could put the most delicious hot fudge cake in front of me, which used to be, that was it. That was my crack. I could not say no. And I would literally scoff and walk off. He'd be like, no, that's not real food. Right? And so I had to do carnivore for, to have that superpower. Some people may not have to do that, but if, if you still have that calling and that craving, 
go carnivore, get rid of all the sugar al alcohols, maybe, maybe just go keto with no sugar alcohols, get the sweet taste out of your mouth because sweet taste has told our body since time immemorial, carbs are coming, so let's raise the insulin so we can gain some weight for the winter. That's kind of what it's all about, right? And I don't want to gain any fat, so therefore I get the sweet stuff out of my mouth. Thank you. Thank you, next question. All right, for some reason y'all are making me want a agave frozen margarita. And I probably have one after this conference. I want to thank you guys so much for, um, for putting this on. Um, I really enjoy the fact that, that y'all are such smart voices in support of the ketogenic lifestyle. I'm a neurologist here in Austin, Texas. I manage Parkinson's patients uh, and other movement disorder patients with, um, with um, a ketogenic diet. And um, I wanted to have y'all take a minute to sort of step away from the macros of keto and start thinking about what, what are the kinds of things that we can do to optimize metabolism and, and, and address metabolic syndrome, not just through macros. So like you mentioned, GLP-1, glucagon-like peptide, there's a number of phytonutrients, flavonoids, uh, that can activate those pathways, like cinnamon, if you can, you know, uh, curcumin, um, a number of, of other substances like berberine, which is very similar to metformin. And so, um, I'd say about 30% of my patients, I'm pretty successful at getting them to change their lifestyle. But it's like trying to get my sister to feed her dog once a day instead of twice a day. Some people just aren't gonna do this. And so I'm using drugs like metformin. I'm using drugs, I just started using a carbose, which is kind of like a prescription version of apple cider vinegar. Nobody wants to take apple cider vinegar. And so I'm just wondering, are there things that you all have had experience with that help to manage patients who aren't going to be as successful with changing all of their diet to get keto, but finding ways to help them be in ketosis more through like intermittent fasting, but other drug or food options and how food is prepared. So I think all those things you mentioned do have a minuscule benefit, keyword being minuscule. Okay, I've used them all, and I agree with you. I've read the research. They do have some benefit, there's no doubt. But until a person is ready to turn down the carbohydrate knob, you're basically playing reindeer games. Sorry, let me just be blunt, okay? But now, if, if you need that as kind of a gateway thing, we're going to do this to get you to here, that's, that's fine. But if, if they, they have to understand the core concept that they are carbohydrate overdosed, that's what's wrong with their metabolism. Their metabolic processes are perfect. Nobody's metabolism is broken. You just got to stop poisoning your metabolism, and it'll go right back to functioning as optimally as it did as when you were five years old. Okay, that, and that's kind of my practice philosophy, and it seems to work pretty well. But uh, all those things do have some benefit, but I think 100% of the benefit is going to come from getting rid of the, the carbohydrate overdose. So uh, I want to take a little contrarian view from what we discussed earlier because many of the things that you're talking about, the phenols, the flavonoids, these are also anti-nutrients because they bind to protein, they bind to several uh, minerals and prevent their absorption. And these are released in the colon. The colon is a very small part of the human digestive tract because if you compare our colon size, it's 10% the size of a primate ancestor. So if we are trying to say that the flavonoids and certain natural herbal products are the way to cure our system, you got to also reconcile that they are only being released in the colon. The degree of absorption is somewhat not as much as we think their kinetics as to how much they circulate in the blood, what they do in the blood is completely unknown. And a contrarian point of view is coming from the carnivore community saying that these could actually be harmful for us. So uh, it's just a contrarian point that you should consider. It's only the discussion between people who promote flavonoids and the car carnivore group that's gonna improve this discussion and we're gonna come to a better understanding. I was just gonna give a hack to help with cry carbohydrate cravings. Like in working with patients, I'm from Southeast Georgia, shrimp and grits, you know, muffins, cornbread. Yeah, I love that stuff. But you know, getting clients into like a keto, you know, call it keto green lifestyle, getting into that keto lifestyle, a lot of carbohydrate cravings. So I just have a carbohydrate craving hack. And so this is, I have clients 
fast for 15 hours. So I'd have my patient fast for 15 hours, buy a um, very pure cod liver oil like Nordic Naturals or another you know, orange flavored, keep it in the fridge overnight. And then after the 15 hour fast, 15 to 16 hour fast, drink four ounces of this cod liver oil. Like imagine it being a very cold beer and drink that down, like just chug it down, college style, and um, wait an hour and eat a green salad with lots of sprouts and olive oil and vinegar dressing. And let me tell you, their cravings are pretty much next. So that's just a nice hack to empower them. So. And I think, um, in a clinical setting and working with patients, I always try to start with, especially when you know that you're being met with energy that isn't open to the recommended change, or you can read by body language that your recommendations may not be implemented, information is only as powerful as the application, right? So that's where we as practitioners need to read the patient and modify the recommendations. And I think giving them abundance-based goals, like rather than maybe telling them you need to get your carbs under 30 grams and these are all the foods you can't eat, I want you to eat eggs for breakfast every single day. And let me teach you about choline, which is in the egg yolk, and what this does for neuroplasticity and what this does for your neurotransmitters and, and the impact on acetylcholine, right? So you educate and empower them on food as medicine, and you bring in foods that are of the ketogenic diet. They start feeling more balanced. Then you transition to the principle of no naked carbs. Every time you have a carb, you need to have fat or protein with it. So at least that blunts that glycemic impact. Then you start to pull out the total carb load and educate them. And you do have to kind of titrate the education in that sense, I believe, to get outcomes because they have to start feeling better to make the change. When you enter at a mediocre state, you're not going to get a good Richter scale on what you know crappy feels like. So you'll keep bouncing back and forth. You need to get them from mediocre to like decent <laughs> or, or good, not great. And then they'll be ready to bounce up to great because they'll know what poor feels like or crummy feels like once you get them from mediocre up. I just want to make one comment about something I've experienced. Um, it, it's the use of polyunsaturated fats to drive ketosis. And there's some recent data that was just published about using flax, uh, flaxseed oil the high in omega-3, um, which actually reduces insulin resistance, reduces inflammation markers, and drives ketosis. And um, I, what I found, it, it seems like when we cook fish, or if, if you were doing a Mediterranean-style ketogenic diet, you're eating a lot more fish, that it would make sense to not overcook the fish, like to eat more sushi, or if you can get uh, fish oil that's not just like minimally pro processed so that the, the polyunsaturated fat is not degraded because it has biological activity. If you're cooking things too much, then you might lose a lot of that effect. I mean, I've, I've personally experienced high ketone levels after eating sushi uh, that which shouldn't have happened. I just like wanna, fasting levels. Yeah. So I just want to say it's sashimi. Sashimi, that's right. Okay. Just, well, I even have some rice with it too. Right, I get away yeah, with that, okay. which, which I shouldn't, right? So I'm sorry, I just hate to take a contrarian view every single time point. That's okay. <laughs> but uh, we have an acid-based digestion. And there is plenty of data that as we get older, uh, the acid goes down. And one of the primary functions of human acid is an ecological barrier. It prevents the entry of bacteria. The second function is to break down the protein so that you can absorb it. And one of the major things about the expensive tissue hypothesis, which told us that our brain grew from 500 grams to about 1,500 grams, is the ability to cook food. Cooking food makes the nutrients more available for us because we have a large absorptive surface, which is the small intestine, and a very poor ability to actually digest it in terms of our evolutionary heritage. So I would hesitate a lot when people say, I want to eat raw meat and I want to eat raw fish, especially as you get older. So I, but I think we can all agree that any polyunsaturated fats that we're getting should be coming from meat. Like not in a bottle, just the meat that you eat should be the source of any polyunsaturated fats, as I'm saying. Well, the study I was referring to actually showed benefits from polyunsaturated fat from flaxseed oil. So I, I don't think we know for sure. I wouldn't throw out plant foods, you know, just in, in favor of... Oh, I would. Yeah. Well, that's fine. <laughs> but I'm not a doctor either, so... Yeah, well, you know, doctors are wrong a lot too, so... 
Um, one last question on statins. I try to get my patients off of statins because I feel like that is, interferes with mitochondrial function and that it has some basis for increasing risk for diabetes, especially in women. Um, I'm wondering, you know, how do you feel about um, people that are go keto, their LDLs go up a lot of times, uh, their primary care puts them on some, like a statin like Lipitor or Crestor. Um, how do you feel or how do, what is your approach to that as a cardiologist? Can we have a big round of applause for this neurologist? He's asking me a question, despite me being contrarian three times. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, I'm not giving you individual medical advice, and I'm always scared of some pharmaceutical industry out there getting a hitman for me. But in my opinion, and of course, I cannot go on record like this with each patient, Statins are perhaps some of the most overvalued drugs. The degree of benefit... Hey, the degree of audience, benefit is minuscule. In this audience, that's not a contrary view. I'm just saying, that's, that's the consensus here, so... Yeah, I'm sure the consensus is here, but uh, the American Heart Association and the ACC will be after me. I couldn't agree with you more. The degree of damage that statins can cause in terms of causing diabetes, in terms of causing myopathy, in terms of causing issues with memory and cognition, in terms of reducing, we talked about erectile dysfunction and about testosterone, statins reduce testosterone as, as well. So I always give full disclosure to my patients that I don't view statins like 99.9% .9 of my colleagues do, and I would like you to have the opportunity to take statins when you are my patient, but I would not take these drugs myself or give it to any of my family members. So I don't know if that answers your question. Well, I mean, I would say that when I'm trying to get people off of statins, I tend to use niacin, and I, and I also try to use fish oil, because uh, you know, the, there's data that it reduces insulin resistance and, and improves LDL cholesterol. Uh, and, and, and niacin works really well if you just use instant release niacin. I hate to interrupt, I hate yeah. to interrupt, but we got a whole line of questions. Yeah, sorry, thank, thank you. you so much thank for you. all your time. Next question, please. I lost 105 pounds doing keto. Just wait, that was eight years ago. And I've gained quite a bit back. I'm, and so I'm just trying to get back on track. And I'm so excited here to see all these um, different food products that are gonna help me make this um, a normal lifestyle that I can integrate myself into my community rather than having to avoid social functions or or be stressed out about things. But as I'm trying to go back in, this time around I'm really struggling with um, the fact that we're eating sentient creatures. And I'm wondering, maybe Brian, you can answer this. Um, one question, what's our responsibility to the animal community? I come from central Canada where I see the industrial livestock industry and there are some really not nice things that happen. The second question, I don't know which, um, um, healthcare provider to address this to, but what do you think about a vegan or a vegetarian approach to keto? Is that realistic? And full disclosure, I like meat. I'm Okay, so let me make sure I understand the question that you perhaps inadvertently directed toward me. Oh, I wasn't um, sure who else to direct it to. Is what is our responsibility in terms of eating meat because we have an issue, some people have issues with the fact that they're sentient beings. Okay, so... Um, all right, so the, the idea of, uh, of moral agent and being responsible to another moral agent and harming another moral agent, um, especially when it comes to animals, uh, was really popularized by Peter Singer uh, out of Princeton, um, who used um, a sentience-based philosophy in terms of ethics. Uh, and I completely disagree with him. My response to that is simply to say that a moral agent is any agent that can discuss what a moral agent is. And if a moral agent can't discuss that, it's not a moral agent. Therefore, punch the cow in the head and make a burger. That's my response. I, I'll lighten it up. My name's Allie and I'm a recovering vegan. Um, I was a vegan too. I was a vegan in college as well. 
It's yes. been, I don't know how many years, yeah. Um, but yeah, I, 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 when I made the decision to start eating animal and flesh-based foods again, I needed to make peace with eating meat um, because my choices were environmental. But I actually, through my educational process, learned that as being a conscious consumer of animal product, I'm actually contributing to the solution, not the problem. And that by voting with my dollar and su supporting direct farmers at my farmer's market and eating snout to tail, that we're actually supporting regenerative agriculture. Our soil depletion and the demineralization of our soil from industrialized farming of soy and corn is significantly more of a concerning environmental impact than the impact of the production of meat. So that just has to feel, you know, I mean. There's a, there's a book you should check out if this is a concern for you. It's called The Vegetarian Myth. And it's written by, the, by uh, a woman who used to run like the most militant vegan group in the world. And she now eats meat and she talks about the, the fact that veganism is actually worse for the environment than right. eating it. I, I just feel that somehow we have an obligation to ask the industry to be more humane to these there creatures. Is, there is absolutely no doubt. And the reason for that is because when, when meat is killed in a, in a, in a uh, non... Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, you just said it. Humane, thank you. This is, you can tell where my head is, like I don't care. Um, when, when meat is killed in a non-humane way, it makes the meat worse for us. That's why. I don't care about the cow. I, I admit it. I'm sorry if there are any cows here. I don't care about you. But humane killing of the cow makes the meat better for us. And that's important. And, and that's where if you go small scale, not only are you supporting the environmental element, but it's going to be a more humane process. You know, there is some comp concept of xenohormesis or you know the stress factor passing on we definitely know glutamate levels glutamine gets depleted with stress and that makes a tough product that's what brian's <laughs> talking to um, but i do think to for your big picture question then i'll give the mic up um, you can yes you can metabolically do a ketogenic diet as a vegan but i don't think it's going to be a therapeutic diet for your body um, when i started to reincorporate animal product is when i started healing my body and there are just nutrients that are bioavailable to speak to Dr. To Dr. Ali about anti-nutrients, lectins, oxalates, all of the things that can disrupt our digestion of plant particles. Animal product provides us significant higher nutrient density at less digestive distress in a bioavailable package. And um, you just can't mimic things like collagen and gelatin and what that can do for connective tissue and secretory IgA and gut integrity and all those things. Thank you very I just, much. just want to add a couple more things of Please. caution, because a vegan diet could be actually very dangerous for you. You don't absorb vitamin B12. Vitamin B12 is a purely an animal product. The omega-3 fatty acids, plants have a lot of them, but our body is just simply incapable of converting ALA to e, uh, EPA and DHA. So you need to supplement these. Iron, the way our body is supposed to absorb iron, it's from globin, which is the myoglobin found in muscle meat. We have a receptor for that. We don't have a receptor for absorbing iron that's found in plant matter. And there are several amino acids, taurine in particular, that is simply lacking in vegetable food. So a, a vegan diet is only feasible in this day and age because there are all these supplements that are available and you better be loading up on those supplements if you want to follow them. As far as the ethical argument is concerned, i really not qualified to answer that. So I just want to say um, thank you for your question. Uh, we do need to get to the next one, but never apologize for liking meat. Never. Thank ever you. I, apologize. I do like meat, but I, I want to honor the I source. I understand, yeah. but thank you. do not apologize for eating meat. Next question. Hi, my name is Ashley Rogers, and that could not have been a better question to come before mine. Um, thank you so much for being here. Um, getting to ask, ask a question is like getting on a roller coaster for me right now. I'm a kid the candy shop. So um, mostly, I'm con she's coming from the angle of, of the passion towards the animals. And I'm with you. It, it's a cow. I, I'm going to eat it if it's going to make me healthy. Um, as a recovering bodybuilding background, six small meals a day, chicken, rice, and fish and potatoes only, oatmeal and eggs, three times each, you know, of all of them, so that you got 30 grams of protein every three hours. I can now satisfyingly say that I can fast for anywhere from 24 to 72 hours, and I see that there was some wrong there. Yep. 
So now then, I actually don't like meat, but I'll eat it. If it's going to make me feel good and healthy, I will absolutely do whatever's going to make me feel my best. And I believe that as you continue to eat things, your cravings and desires for those things adjust. So my biggest question is, when you're looking at the contrast between Anna Kabeca talks about the green smoothies and the vegetables and things like that, and my experience has been very good to, to include a lot of vegetables. However, I look at gut health and hormones versus gut health, and I see the problems with the vegetables and the gut health and the phytonutrients and the antinutrients, and where Ken Berry would speak to the carnivore world, where, where does that meet? Dr. Berry? So I think there's a spectrum of the proper human diet. And for some people that includes quite a bit of veg. And for other people it includes almost no vegetables whatsoever. Uh, and that's where I currently am. I may not stay there, but that's where I'm feeling the best I've ever felt. And so I'm gonna stay there for a while. You're the same way. I have not eaten a vegetable and I don't know how long. Yeah, every now and then I'll cheat with one of Nisha's Brussels sprouts. But other than that, there's just no, there's just no vegetables. Uh, and so, I'm not sure, what was your question? Well, <laughs> where, where are the benefits of having the vegetables to improve hormones like Anna teaches yeah, versus I, yeah, the gut I, health problems from the anti-nutrients and, and, and how long do you give your body so to adapt? The, I heard what's this the balance, morning. balance, right? That's what you're asking. Yeah. Well, I don't this know morning that you said it only took 24 hours for your gut microbiome to adjust to a all meat diet. Yeah, I, I keep looking That's for the crazy. magical phytonutrients in plants, and I was talking to Dr. Saladino about this, and we're going to talk, start talking about zoonutrients, right? The animal phyto, the, the phytonutrients yes. of meat, because I, when, you, when you look at the phytonutrients, you quickly come to look at them from the other side. These are actually anti-nutrients almost all the time. And so I think some people can tolerate veg in their diet and do okay. Some people can't tolerate it. So are there benefits from eating vegetables? Maybe, but I'm having trouble seeing them in, in many people, myself included. So I want Dr. Kobeka also to get yeah, way in this way. I'll, I'll just say, say one thing, because I think we've all talked about um, adjustments, upping healthy fats, which helps with hormone balance. So I think mm -hmm. it's more about being in a ketogenic state. Mm -hmm. And within each individual person, maybe there's some personal optimization and adjustments. And, and I will tell you, self-experimentation is awesome. Um, you learn a lot about yourself and about thing, you know, things that, as a doctor, you're like, oh, yeah, right, that, that's not going to work. And you're like, oh, my god, that made everything better. Like, how could that be possible? So um, you, you probably have more clinical experience uh, with those changes. But. Yeah, I mean, I think it's really a great question. I want to make a really strong point. You are what you ate ate, right? So if you're eating meat that's been corn fed and it's contaminated with the mycotoxin, zearelin, you're creating estrogen dominance and other hormonal disruptors, right? Mm -hmm. If you're eating something that's been um, fed with olives, like we had last night, what was that, Wagyu with olive, fed olives, mm -hmm. like, I mean, how amazing is that? What I found in my clinical work with now thousands of perimenopausal and postmenopausal women is that adding the fiber and the greens and the low carbohydrate greens makes a huge difference. It increases microbial diversity, improves cognition, improves membrane, enables this, keep, this ketogenic state mm -hmm. to be supreme, okay. to be powerful, to be amazing an individual. So I say, do your detective work. See what works best for you. And if there's a gut dysbiosis issues, if there's a GI issue, I mean, that always has to be addressed. You know, from a functional medicine perspective, we know that increasing microbial diversity, improving the gut microbiome in general, is going to empower our health, empower our hormonal balance. And that's you know, that's critical so for So you would say that optimizing gut health would help optimizing hormones more than focusing on the hormones and then optimizing the gut. Got it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, real quick, yeah. I was, I was, okay. she I was just going to say there are particular compounds that you can get only in vegetation that you can't get in meat, you know, and, and so I don't look at it mutually exclusive. Okay. But I do say when I, I have spoken to anti-nutrients and gut irritants, you need to get your gut lining in check. And so what I'll do often is like a three-day bone broth fast with a client. So you're actually providing them an abundance of gelatin, glutamine, these compounds that actually feed the enterocytes or the cells that line your gut. 
that should make you less reactive or less sensitive to the damaging compounds in vegetables, but still allow you to get the sulfur-containing compounds in your cruciferous to drive detox support, to still get the fiber to feed as a prebiotic and such. But I agree, very individualized. You need to support the gut lining if you're having a, a feedback that's negative and work with digestive enzymes, mm -hmm. probiotic, work all that first. Thank you so much. Next question, please. All right, is this loud enough? Yeah. All right, Dr. Ali, Linus Pauling's theory on getting five to 10 grams of vitamin C a day to reduce placking of thinning arterial walls. Your thoughts on it, the validity? Can you come Even that wasn't loud enough? Oh, so <laughs> want me to you're saying that you want to have a lot of vitamin C to No, he was asking you. about your, your no, opinion no. on Linus Pauling's uh, recommendation uh, of... So, uh, <laughs> You know, I hate to be contrarian every single time. <laughs> uh, Linus Pauling, great man, won the Nobel Prize, I think a couple of times, and then he kind of went on to the uh, vitamin C as the cure-all for everything. And I'm not sure that is true because everything helps to a certain degree at a certain amount, and increasing it to supra-therapeutic levels does not have any additional benefit. In addition, there are people who are on a purely carnivore diet who are getting lower levels of vitamin C who function amazingly well. So the amount of vitamin C that you need depends on the kind of diet you're eating. If you're more of a vegetable-based person, you may perhaps need a little more. If you're carnivore-based, you probably need far less. And I think that I would not take vitamin C as a cure-all for vascular disease or for coronary disease or heart disease because after you reach a certain threshold, there is no additional benefit. Yeah. yeah, I actually read Dr. Pauling's book on this when I was 17 years old and I can remember walking around in the backyard of my grandmother's house going, God, this is it. I just got to get to the grocery and buy a bunch of vitamin C. But no, no. Now as an adult, no, yeah, I, I, I greatly admire him for his scientific work. He was a brilliant scientist and, and a very persuasive writer as well. But now l looking with the totality of the, the evidence and the research that I've been privy to in the, in the clinical practice, no, I don't, I don't think there's any truth to that at all. Dr. Which kind of makes me sad because I remember how happy I was when I read that book. And, and I would say that that may be applicable to a lot of the science that we hear like on certain phytonutrients, et cetera, is that they're being looked at in a general population, right, that's eating probably a standard American diet. And so maybe there is some slight benefit to these antioxidants in someone who's living in a very oxidized state, whereas in this group where we really are lowering those things, they just now we're talking about infinitesimal or no additional benefit. Yeah, if, you, if you're you. talking about antioxidants and you remove the oxidants, you no longer need the antioxidants because you've taken the crap out. You don't need to. And now you have ketones, which are the ultimate right. antioxidant. Right. Yes. Thank you. Next question, please. Hi there. My name is Rick. I, uh, I would consider myself a health and wellness more enthusiast. I'm, uh, I consider myself fairly healthy, especially among my friends. But I'm also kind of a junk food lover as well, right? And um, so doing keto, watching YouTube videos, having spreadsheets. Um, when I'm at home, I do very well. You know, we're able to cook the food and control the environment. When we're out, we do our best, right? I'd say 90% of the time, I'm eating very, very well. But you come to shows like this, you're traveling this morning, put a few potatoes on my plate, walk into this convention, I see Whataburger on the side, I'm like, I think I have to try that before I get out of here. And so for me, my question to you guys is, what do you guys feast on? What's your junk food? To us, you guys seem very superhuman. You come here and you, know, you think that you're on top of the world amongst your community when talking about health and fitness, and you come here, you're like, holy crap, I know nothing. I'd listen to you guys and I'm confused half the time, even though I listen to, you know, I, I, very, I study this stuff very well. So to each of you guys, I want to know, when you go out and splurge, what do you eat? And tell me about your most recent occurrence. So, okay, as, as again, 
the idiot of the group. I'm going to go first so that we can actually get intelligence at the end of the conversation. Um, but I want to just ask you one question. It's a rhetorical question, but why do you think that you're less worthy when you're traveling than when you're taking care of yourself at home? So I'm just going to leave it at that. I don't worry. I'm just worry. going to leave it at that. <laughs> I still enjoy it. So my, my, the answer to your question is uh, my splurge food is hamburger patties with cheese on it. That's my, that's my junk food. What was cool. that? Hamburger patties with cheese on it. So, so, yeah, so I would say that, that I would maybe go to Whataburger, but I would leave the bun, right? So I, right. Would, I would still go and I would still, I mean, my, my <laughs> awesome, you know, bacon and egg cheeseburger. I might eat the bun still. I'm just letting yeah. you know. So, so, so that's it. I mean, I guess you do it long enough and you don't want that. You, you never do that because it just doesn't appeal to you anymore. What's my splurge? I'm supposed to be a role model. I'm not supposed to <laughs> show weakness. It's a vodka tonic, isn't it? Yeah. No, uh, no I, I guess uh, uh, I like sweets, flan and a few other things, and sometimes I splurge on them, so I guess. But overall, I think I, you could call me a model citizen. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I kind of adhere to the... 10, 80, 10 rule. So 10% fasting, 80% keto green, let's say, and 10% feasting. And so like feasting, dark chocolate. Love dark chocolate and wine, the combination. I think it's heaven, heavenly. Oh, I will say this. If I can find a, a keto dark chocolate peanut butter combination that has no sugar in it, I, I will roll myself in it and just absorb it. All, like, but I haven't yet. But I haven't yet. So that's why. So Nisha and I, we stopped at Whataburger on the way here, and I had two bacon double cheeseburgers with mustard, and I left all the carbs to the side. And so, but, and that was, that, for me, that's a normal meal, but I'm not towing the carnivore party line here, but the, the best splurge that I have had in months was the pound and a half brontosaurus rib that I had over at Terry Black's for lunch. There, there literally is no food on this planet that you could put in front of, put side by side with that, that beef rib, that fatty, succulent, sensual, <laughs> sexual, okay? There is no food you could put on this plate that would make me turn that plate down. So to me, that's a feast. Very descriptive. Channel savory. Um, pork rinds. Pork rinds are my go-to. When I'm feeling like I have a craving and I need salty, crunchy, pork rinds dipped in guacamole, pork rinds dipped in, not peanut butter yet. Uh, brand. Oh, brand. I thought he said in peanut butter. I was like, oh, I, I could mess with that, actually. <laughs> that sounds like I could get down on it. I just, I just <laughs> like, got it myself excited. Um, I, I, I'm right now doing um, Epic brand. Yeah. Again, I'm, I'm a big source, quality source. Um, but yeah, I, I like the Himalayan salt. My three-year-old daughter... Give your kids fat and protein, right? Let them snack on crunchy pork rinds. Um, I also love sprouted nuts. Um, I'll every now and then throw in like a freeze-dried fruit in there, like freeze-dried strawberry, freeze-dried dried raspberry. That's a really great blend and nut butter packs. And um, that all works. Pork rinds and salmon roe, though, is like a next-level superhuman. <laughs> that would make a nice nacho. It, yeah. Pork rinds and if salmon I, If I could follow up with one more on, on nuts specifically, because I go crazy for you know, a, a planter's deluxe carton of nuts, right? And I've learned, especially even with spinaches, that lectins can be harmful, especially when it comes to absorption of nutrients. It, how, I guess, it's not really talked about very often, but how, how bad is it to, I guess, feast on nuts, seeds, or even something like spinach in regards to lectins and other uh, I would never feast on nuts or seeds, to be clear. Sure. I well, would, I, I guess I would... overeat. Sure. I just think that those foods, yes, in a high amount would cause digestive distress, but I said sprouted nuts. And uh, so we're mimicking the process of nature, right? So when we're eating sprouted nuts, just like squirrels do in nature, they put the, the nuts in their, their cheek, they bury it, and they, don't wait, they wait to eat it because they know that those anti-nutrients are toxic. So we have to mimic nature, you know, and we also in nature wouldn't, the, the, the fact of getting a nut out of a shell, like if you were cracked pecans, right? Like I dare you to eat more than a cup of nuts if you have to actually take them out of their tree shell. So we have to think about that, the accessibility to food and getting back to a more natural approach to consuming it. And that will help you with portion control. For sure. Thank Thanks you for guys. your question. Appreciate it. Thank you. Next question, please. Hi, my name is Tammy and um, I my husband was recently di diagnosed with stage two rectal ca cancer. 
So this is a question for the oncologist. Um, he is very interested in the keto lifestyle. I've been doing it for so long that he is very envious of my energy and just the superhuman feeling we get by, by doing that. He also understands that cancer feeds on sugar and wants to cut that out. The problem is he's missing a large intestine and has the ileostomy. Um, and when he did try it, he lost a significant amount of weight when he was already pretty thin to begin with. So what I'm looking for specifically is how do you approach this lifestyle when your meals have to be pretty small due to the rapid metabolism that he has and when you're missing a third of your digestion system? Uh, so I will say that animal proteins are mostly digested in the stomach, so that's a good source, but also increasing fat and calories. So sorry for saying the word calorie, <laughs> but sometimes we really actually need to increase the intake in, in a patient. Um, we want to make sure that he's actually digesting and absorbing, so sometimes there are some digestive issues. A patient with an ileostomy, you're actually, you can maybe see what's coming in the bag, <laughs> yeah. are you actually digesting and absorbing? Um, but it, it, again, it's a bit of a patient, everybody's in a different space, but anytime I have a patient who's just losing too much weight and I really look at food diaries, they're, they're not taking in enough or, or they actually are in a state because maybe they're getting chemotherapy or something else and they actually have increased needs. So you would just say more calories, more fat, yeah, and an adequate protein and make, and again, I would look, what, what types of foods, is he trying to do this vegetarian, <laughs> is he trying to do this heavy, uh, you know, uh, uh, animal-based, um, I, I think it's a little bit of an experiment, um, I think you could supplement with some protein uh, powders, you know, cleaner uh, uh, protein drinks um, with adequate fat, but again, I do think that sometimes our needs, both for protein and fat, are up when we're in that type of a state. Thank you. Next question, please. Not all heroes wear capes. I want to thank all of you for getting conventional medical training and then breaking outside that box. And uh, I'm struggling with ketosis a little bit right now. Probably hormones, maybe reactivated Epstein bar, but I've picked up great information here today. Uh, but I'm a 100% holistic cancer survivor with keto as the underpinning. And um, I daydream, thank you. I daydream that someday we can find a way to crowdsource scientific experiments. People like us in attendance here today could do the GoFundMe for my scientific experiment. Uh, I've come to that conclusion because I try to read, and I'm not scientific, but I try to read studies and sometimes they confound me. And in the area of cancer, there's one in particular, people uh, routinely say to me, well, some cancers are fueled by ketones now. So I went and I, I haven't pulled all those studies, but I looked at a prominent one and it was done in vitro and they added lactate to the ketones. Now, I think they also had a high insulin uh, gel too. So again, in real people, right, we are not a closed system. Uh, we, we do things super differently than what a Petri dish does. <laughs> okay, right. I thought, yeah, because cancer cells have been observed bathing in lactate. They love it. So I thought, well, doesn't that obfuscate the, the whole ketone? Formula, so I, like, yeah. I recently on Twitter, I, I called out all of the pseudo experts and I said, I keep hearing about these cancer lines that can thrive on ketones, right? Please list them below. And I'm still waiting for a response. <laughs> okay, good. Okay? It's not just me. <laughs> so there are a few strains that can limp by in the right conditions with ketones present. Cancer without exception thrives on sugar. The only way you can have the logarithmic growth of cancer cells is with glucose, It with sugar. You can't do that. They, they can never, they don't have the, the metabolic machinery to do it with fat. Sorry, it just doesn't exist. And there will be some people who will argue with that. All you have to do is just say, list the strains of the, the cancer. Which ones? Okay. Tell me the names. And yeah, and that, the conversation will be over because there is not one. 
Great, great. Thank you. I now, re that. regarding your, your point about crowdfunding experiments, there are sites out there, and they're looking for us. So go to Google, crowdfund science research, awesome. and find them. Awesome. Go to them. Thank yes. you. Okay, last question. We have time for one more question. All right, I, I'm John Martinez. I'm a family physician, so a fellow physician like yourselves. Um, so I guess a two-part question to kind of end all this. Number one, what can we as physicians do to kind of push forward public policy, looking at more of a ketogenic, low-carb, changing the nutrition policy that we have? And then the second part to that, hold on, second part to that, what's your advice as a physician to all these people back here on how they talk to their physicians to start educating them as well, too. Well, let's go with Dr. Barry first because I think he's got a thought or two on that sort of so, thing. Oh, I've given up on um, us having any effect on public policy at the federal or state level. Uh, that, for me, that's a waste of time. I've just decided to educate all you guys and let you go home and raise hell when you get home. <laughs> that's my plan. And so when all these people get home, they're going to go back to their doctor, and when he says some stupid shit, they're going to be like, wait a minute, what? Okay? And these people are going to basically teach their mid-level providers and their doctors, and then that's going to ripple through that doctor's patient population, right? Does that make sense? And so this has got to come from the bottom up. It's never going to come. I don't think it's going to come from a policy level down. I gave up on that five years ago. I'm going to teach all these people and get all these people pissed off and then let them go wreak havoc. But I would recommend, you know, Nina T. Schultz has the Nutrition Coalition, and she is, and, and, uh, she is talking to Congress people. Um, and so that's one way we can support potentially having at least some headway. Uh, but I agree, I think it's educating somebody else who educates 20 more people, who educates 20 more people. And, and I would say that if you do go to a conventional doctor and they've told you to you know, eat a low-fat, plant-based diet and, and you didn't, and you're having success, tell them what you're doing because if they think that you're doing what you, they told you to do and they're seeing success, they are gonna think it's because of them. And we want to educate them that it's because they did the exact opposite of what they told them. Right. So that's nutritioncoalition.org, I believe, is, is Nina's uh, website. Go there. There are petitions to sign. There are ways to get involved. There are ways to start pushing this from, from your living room. So if you're interested, if you actually care, and you're not just a hypocrite, go there and do that. So I want to echo uh, what Ken Berry just said. The change is going to come from bottom up. It's a grassroots effort. I also just want to add that medical knowledge is no longer the sole property of medical professionals. I have learned more from the citizen scientists than I have learned from my peers. And in treatment of chronic disease, like for example, you break a bone or you have appendicitis or you have a heart attack, by all means go to the hospital and get treated. But for chronic diseases, the medical profession is very lacking. And unless they heed the warning of all the people out here, they are truly going to get buggy whipped. <laughs> Anybody, you guys have anything else? All right, I would like a, a few guys to put your hands together, a large round of applause for these wonderful, wonderful folks.